Betty. Hope everybody's doing well. Niemann Halma. Lately, I've found myself a lot more comfortable expressing my thoughts in Chinese, so please excuse me if my line of thought isn't as well organized when I'm speaking in English. But if you bear with me, I promise you will get out of here smiling by the time I end. So, as introduced, my name is Hoden Osman, and I come from a country called Somalia. Any of you heard of it before? Yes, that's not loud enough. Thank you. What do you know about Somalia? That's what I want to know. It's okay. I won't mind. Shout. What do you know about Somalia? Hai Tao. It's okay. You can say it. Number one, Hai Tao. Number two? Sorry? Very good. Okay. That's, that's a lot of very good information. There's one thing you don't know about Somalia. Somalia is the land with the most beautiful women in East Africa. Agree? <laughs> On a more serious note, Somalia is one of the most beautiful countries in East Africa. Only somebody who's been there would know. Because I also only found out very recently. I'm Somali, yes, but I was not born in Somalia and I was not raised there. I went there at a later age to discover my own home. A home that I thought was completely different because in the media, the Somalia I saw was suffering from drought. The Somalia I saw was suffering from famine. The Somalia I saw was suffering from civil wars. So like you, in my imagination, I thought that Somalia must be a terrible place to live in. To my surprise, that's not the truth. Somalia has one of the most beautiful coastlines and beaches on the African continent. Somalia has one of the most diverse and most beautiful wildlife in the African continent. Somalia has some of the richest farmlands on the African continent. And these are facts. I'm not saying because I'm emotional about my home country, but these are facts people know. Not a lot of you know about though. Why? I study communication studies. I analyze media. I analyze film. I analyze content in media. And it's always surprising why the stories we hear in the news, in the films, are always sensational. They talk about the war, they talk about the pirates, they talk about the famine, they talk about the drought, they talk about everything that's negative. How many of them speak about the positivities that lay there every day? How many of them speak about the everyday stories of people just living their normal lives? How many? I'm sad to say, not many. And that is why people have the wrong idea about the richest continent on the entire planet, Africa. Africa in recent years became synonymous with underdevelopment. It became synonymous with chaos. It became synonymous with everything that's bad. And that's sad because that's not the reality on the ground. People who have been there, people who have visited, people who have seen for themselves and have lived there know that Africa is a land where children are happy. I'll give you a very simple example. Last year, I went with some of my colleagues to Zanzibar. Anyone from Tanzania? Nice. Zanzibar is one of the most beautiful places I've ever visited. But you know what's more beautiful? The children everywhere are just laughing and smiling and running around. My Chinese friends were surprised and they just stopped and said, Hey, I 
I'm like, of course, Tama Kaishin, of course they're happy. They have a blue sky every day, right? It's true. They're not missing anything and they don't know that they're missing anything. And that's the beauty of it. Now, we come back to what it is the reality in Africa today. Yes, there is lack of infrastructure connectivity. Yes, there is lack of technological improvement. Yes, there is a lot that's lacking on the continent. But that doesn't mean that poverty was Africa's destiny. I believe that poverty disrupted Africa's destiny. I'll give you a very simple example. In the 1980s, Somalia was the number one exporter of bananas in the world. Would you believe that? It was the number one exporter of bananas in the entire world. Somalia's bananas were the, amongst the most tasty in the entire planet. Today, we don't have anybody farming. Why? Everybody thinks there's a beautiful life in Europe, in America. They're taking boats, risking their lives, and they're dying because of illegal migration. Because they don't know what they can produce, the wealth they can produce in their own lands, right in their neighborhoods. They don't know the wealth they have. They only see in the media the high rises in New York and the beautiful streets in Paris. Wouldn't you also want to go there? 13 years ago when I came to China, almost all of my Chinese friends longed to go to America, longed to go to Europe. Why? Because they saw those places as extremely developed as beautiful, as fascinating. Now, what about you young graduates, especially my Chinese friends here at the stage? When you graduate, where do you want to work? Beijing, Shanghai, Shenzhen, right? Am I right to assume that? Yes, why? Because in 13 years, Beijing, Shanghai, Shenzhen became a lot more beautiful than some of the leading capitals in the world today. Last year, I visited Los Angeles, New York, Washington, London. And guess what? When I sat in the subways in these cities, I kind of felt a lot more comfortable in the subways in Shanghai. And that's the reality of development. It's a moving wheel. It's never standing still. It's always moving. So however you see Africa today, trust me, in 10 years time, it will be completely different. Another example, 13 years ago, I came to China. My first stop, naturally, was Beijing. And then I was heading to the university where I, was supposed to, where I was supposed to start my Chinese language. It's a city called Yangzhou. Yanghua Xianyue. Xiaoyangzhou, very good. Yangzhou is a beautiful city in, Suzhou, in Jiangsu province. Now, I took a train from Beijing to Yangzhou. It took me 14 hours. And I sat on Wopo. Do the young people in the audience know what that is? I think it's beyond your times, yeah? Maybe the gentleman in the front would know? Yes. Now, for me, it was the first time I take a train. It was fascinating for me how slow it was, how it stopped in almost every little town we went through and how long the journey was. I couldn't sleep, although I was extremely exhausted. Why? Because I thought I would miss my stop. I did not speak a single word of Chinese, and everything was in Chinese. Most importantly, all of the cities sounded alike. 
how am I going to know when I'm in Yangzhou? So I couldn't sleep. And I kept asking and asking and asking, are we in Yangzhou yet? And nobody spoke English. Luckily, I found my way. Now, what about today? Today, I can take a train from Beijing and it will take me to Hangzhou in how long? Five hours. How amazing is that? That is the transformative force of development nobody can stop. However, what does development actually need? I mean, the same years that are passing while I'm in China are passing while my family and friends are in Somalia. Difference is, when I'm in China, every day I look here, there's a new building. I look there, there's a new road. I look there, there's a new train station. What about in Africa? Not many countries in Africa have witnessed this kind of transformative force. Ethiopia is one, Djibouti is another, Kenya is another, but why? Let's ask ourselves, how come some countries in Africa are witnessing transformative changes in their countries and the lives of their people and the socio-economic development, while some aren't? It's because most of Africa's countries are yet to actually take a long-term vision of development into their policy of governance. And that is where China succeeded. China planned for this 40 years ago. Everything you see today was planned and envisioned and continuously implemented. We don't have a lack of plans in Africa. When I went to Somalia, I visited almost every single minister we have. I looked in their cupboards. They have these huge books of researches, of plans, national development plans that are gathering dust. Why? Because when a new minister comes, he wants to make a new plan. When a new government comes, they scrap everything out and they come up with something new. I mean, I'm all for change and everything, but still, there is merit to continuity. And that is what we need to learn as Africans from China. Make up your mind. Where do you want to be in 50 years? Where do you want to take your people in 50 years? Where do you want to take your country in 50 years? And stick to that plan. That is the only way that the stigma that haunts every African will go away. Do you agree? Let's see some of the changes happening in the continent. This year, two months ago to be exact, I had the pleasure to go to Nigeria. Now, for our viewers in China, when you look at that station, do you see anything different from what you see here in China? It's quite similar, right? As I walked up, it felt so familiar. I felt like I was in Jinghua. It really looks like one of the train stations in Jinghua. Most interestingly, this is Edu Station. This is the departure hall. The only difference was when I realized that I'm not in China, I'm in Africa, is when I saw Nigerian men, women, and children in a line trying to buy tickets and getting into the train station. This is the ticket I bought. And this is the train track that I was about to travel on. And this is the train made in China for Africa. This train was completely filled, completely filled. No single seat was empty. And it's like that five times a day, taking people in between Abuja and Kaduna. 
Its entire length is 186.5 kilometers, and it travels 100 kilometers an hour. When you're sitting inside, it's no different than when sitting in one of the old trains here in China. The only difference is the scenery outside. That is not China. However, this is the change that's happening. This is the change that's happening, and China realized one very important principle. We all live in the same world. We all share the same resources. They're not infinite. They're going to end. It is our responsibility to be responsible in how we use these resources. And it is our responsibility to ensure the quality of life people on this planet are going to live in. And all of that is embodied in one message. Something that's called Building a community with a shared future. What does that mean? It means that my happiness is connected to yours. My prosperity is connected to yours. My life is connected to yours, because if today I use up all of your resources just to make my own little life better for 50 years, what, am, what are my children going to live on after that? Because I've depleted your resources. I haven't created development in your side. So that's how we are interconnected. And that's how we are interdependent on each other. And this is what China realized. I was very fortunate and honored to be a part of this year's FOCAC Summit. During the roundtable sessions, leaders from 53 countries spoke their mind about how they viewed their relations with China, how they viewed China-Africa relations and how they viewed the notion of building a community with a shared future between China and Africa. And it was a unanimous, a unanimous thought that our fates are interdependent, that they all agree if we don't move together, we will go nowhere. In Somali, we have a saying that says, which means a single finger cannot wash a face on its own. If you want to clean your face, you need ten fingers, which means we need to all gather together to build up our shared happiness. Thank you very much. Thank you.